Okay. Thanks a lot. No, I'm not hands. Uh, sadly, I'm tying straight into the, uh, the, the usual Celtic mentality of, yeah, sure, I'll give it a go, no problem, rather than uh, think things through. But I think what was good and why I wanted to speak as well is that, you know, this conference gives us an opportunity in our geo industries to talk about stuff that we're not really used to. And I think the last presentation particularly, uh, speaking about climate change resilience, speaking about sustainable urban drainage systems, SUDs, which have become very, very relevant these days in an urban design capacity, speaking about issues such as land value uplift, uh, residual land value issues, which I'm going to speak about, like uh, Vanessa spoke about yesterday, and speaking about issues such as, and I'm veering off the topic of BIM for a moment because this is a subject close to my heart as well, mentioning things like COP21. It's very, very important that we within our geo industry start, really start to understand the language of other people who are starting to use our information to make major, major decisions. One of the issues that uh, Oper just spoke about, about Bangladesh, for instance, remind me about ecosystem value. We're doing a lot of work on that, so is the rest of the world. There's a big project in Belize. Belize destroyed all of its mangroves over the last 10 years, for instance. Belize City flooded, caused $500 million worth of damage. So what's the value of those mangroves now? And this is the way a lot of countries are starting to see, and this is the way a lot of the development aid agencies are starting to see, the way ecosystems and natural barriers and the reinstatement of them, if they've been destroyed, can really help with flood resilience. But uh, back onto the boring stuff of BIM. Well, not really boring. But what I'm going to try and do on the BIM scenario, and this is a, a presentation that I prepared for land surveyors. I'm a land surveyor by background. I'm from Dublin originally. I now live in London. Uh, was looking into the realities of BIM, building information modeling, and also that no man's land, that gray area between BIM acceptability that we're all used to, geospatial modeling, laser scanning, yeah, 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 great, and also into the smart city scenario and the way that these two differing models, these two different data models, are starting to interact. So there's a gray area in between. So it's a kind of a, a short tail of two scales, in a way. Oops. OK, so I'm just going to give a, a short introduction to BIM. For those of you who haven't heard about it before, I'm sure most of you had have uh, the BIM challenge that we're facing within construction and property and facilities management and also within geospatial, a reality check for us in the geospatial fields with the, what's really going on in the situation, uh, BIM and practice and then a bit about GIS and smart cities and then some uh, conclusions and future issues for us to deal with. So BIM itself, building information modeling, many of you have been working within CAD systems, you've been using information modeling, you've been using all different kinds of things for architecture and project management, uh, fabrication, engineering, design. But building information model essentially is really about long-term strategic asset management for our built environment. Most of what we have in the world is already built. We've built most of it already. So it's about managing these in our scenarios in the developing, developed world, <coughs> often creaking infrastructures in the most economic uh, method that we can. BIM is essentially about collaboration. It's a people issue rather than a technology issue. It's not just three-dimensional CAD on steroids. Uh, it's not a new technology application. And it's not next generation, it's already here. But it's essentially about collaboration. Collaboration between all of the different professionals and policymakers working in the built environment sector. So architects and engineers and surveyors and quantity surveyors and designers and planners working in a collaborative scenario. Now as you know how the professions work, this is easier said than done. It's usually the people issues about sharing information, about sharing knowledge, about sharing capacity that causes the most problems rather than technology itself. There's also an issue of terminology between the different professions. What we mean by measurement can mean something completely different to an architect, something very different to an engineer, if you've ever tried to explain scale, for instance, to engineers or architects. 
the fact that in CAD you can zoom in to 0 0.0001 of a millimeter on the screen, but that's not necessarily the, uh, uh, related to the data capture techniques and the types of accuracies we're talking about from a, from a data capture geospatial point of view. <coughs> And then also is the issues around these, uh, these critical conversations with clients and how we tie into it. So it's about trying to make our built environment more successful. I was going to speak fundamentally about the economic issues behind this, but I think also we need to think about the climate issues as well, particularly following on from the last speaker. One of the largest contributors to climate, uh, to carbon, embedded carbon particularly, is the built environment. You know, I'm not just talking about the type of energy that we use in a building like this, but all the energy that goes into creating this building in the first place. There's an enormous amount of embedded carbon already within our built environment that we use up. So it's about managing that process better. <coughs> also, from a global wealth, uh, wealth point of view, the, the general belief is that nearly 70% of our global wealth is tied up in real estate. Those of you who know valuation like I do, Know that these kind of issues are, you know, generally amorphous. They're almost a, uh, a false construct. They're in our own minds. Something is is a market value of something is what we generally think it will get on the open market, buying or selling it, rather than its intrinsic true worth. But you know, but that's the issue of BIM, and that's the issue that we have to deal with within geospatial. Is how do we connect these dots between this life cycle? This property life cycle going from land, either undeveloped or brownfield, previously developed, to the construction phases, to the buying and selling and the property phases that we all know and love, to the data handling, to the cost, data sets, and then to the payment, and then remediation, demolition, back to land, and off we go again on another cycle. So it's about trying to uh, bring these dots closer together. And that's essentially what BIM tries to do. It looks at time, it looks at technologies, it looks at quality of information, and it looks, and I think this is a key issue for us, particularly in a conference like this, where we're talking about new issues, is to learn this language that other people start to use, particularly policy makers, particularly those in finance who are essentially paying for uh, our information. As the Chair Steve uh, likes to stay on a regular basis, nothing is free. Absolutely right, nothing is free. There's no such thing as free open data. We don't map for a laugh, do we? We don't survey things. We do it because somebody wants to do something with it. They either want to sell it, they want to exploit it, they want to demolish it, they want to rebuild it, they want to reuse it, they want to change its use, they want to do something with it. That's why we do it. So BIM essentially is trying to bring these different bits together, particularly these elements of risk. And that's what we really do within geospatial information. We provide an insurance policy with our data for people. We de-risk that investment process, either through climate change resilience issues or through providing good spatial information for people to make realistic decisions on, either through sustainability issues and then back into the time again as well. So this is a nice little kind of visualization of all the period and moment where it's supposed to tie in from renovation and demolition right the way through. But, of course, it's not the technology driving all of this. Technology is all very nice and it has a certain wow factor. I particularly like that uh, climate change matrix grid where you could show what the different effects on different areas are due to the heat, etc. I know the Chinese, for instance, are really in building uh, heat corridors, wind corridors into different uh, urban planning scenarios and urban structures because of these issues of urban heat islands. I live in London. I'm from Dublin, but when I come to London, it's almost semi-tropical compared to what I'm used to. There's at least an uplift of 10, 12 degrees. That's mainly because there's a lot of wind flowing through, London, through Dublin, for instance, off the Irish Sea, and even across from the Atlantic area. But in London, that isn't the case. Certainly not in central London, where on a hot summer's day, it can feel very, very uh, heavy duty. So, the economic drivers behind it, and some of these, these issues uh, are, are quite incredible. Just from a UK scenario, construction implies 3 million people. Within the RICS, within the surveying industry, we reckon that we have a shortage of 50,000 people at the moment. In all areas, from construction, uh, quantity surveying, to land, to uh, geospatial, to technical innovation, etc. HS2 
high-speed rail system going from London to Birmingham. They, we spoke to them the other day. They told us we need 200 surveyors now who are expert in compulsory purchase valuation and acquisition. The government had put aside five billion pounds. What's that? Seven billion euros just for the land acquisition for a project that's going to cost 50 billion probably overall. So where are we going to get 250 qualified professionals from right now? We don't keep them in the cupboard in the institution. Some people think we do, but we don't. <coughs> so that's just some of the scenarios we're dealing with because construction essentially, those of you who are from a construction background, like I am really, uh, know it's cyclical. So we'll all come back around again. It delivers 107 billion output. It's a <coughs> key contributor. It's critical in making climate change. This is about thinking bigger. You know, it's not just the amount of energy that we're using, it's the amount of energy going into the construction in the first place. And there's a huge asset management sector starting to grow up. Some of the, uh, the enormous geospatial projects in the UK recently, such as the Network Rail Asset Management Project, where the entire rail network was flown to 1 is to 100 scale. LiDAR-based helicopter work, for instance, don't know how they achieve those kind of specifications. But essentially, that was about asset management data capture. Every, every control box, every bridge, every sewer. And it's for quite mundane stuff. The highways agency as well. It's about who's getting the contract for cleaning between section 20 and 25, for instance. And a lot of the information we provide that we think looks fantastic and has a wow factor is actually going to be used for quite boring uh, type of scenarios at the end of the day. And then also when I speak more into the level 2 BIM end of things, they reckon that there's a 20% capital saving, and I'm going to go back to this a bit later on, and then global air construction forecast is going to grow by over 70%. So 20% saving, 70%, these are huge numbers starting to add up around it. Now I know what you're all thinking, who gets that 20%? That we're, all, that we're helping to save these clients. I'll come back to this a bit later when we start to talk more about residual land value. Some of you will know the Gartner Hype Curve. I must uh, commend my friend Lee Braybrook in Trimble for making me aware of this at a recent uh, European conference where we looked at the Gartner Hype Curve, BIM, smart cities, and where different countries were compared to you know, other countries. Some are on it, some are not. <coughs> so you know, a technology trigger. I know Ed will know all about this. Peak of inflated expectations. Hey, it's fantastic, isn't it all great? We all did this, didn't we? We all did this with laser scanning, drones. We've all been through this from survey technology, GIS in the 90s. Remember that? Gonna save the world. Then we discovered the data wasn't there. Then we went down into a trough of disillusionment. It's rubbish, I'm not using that anymore. Same with laser scanning, and then we actually go up the slope of enlightenment towards the plateau of productivity, where we start to take this technology and see how we can use it. All the technologies go through this. My kids go through this. They're probably going through it now looking at virtual, re virtual reality, another classic example. And none of the technologies that we use within the geo end of things are beyond any of this. This is a Gartner hype cycle with, uh, from 2012, not that long ago, where we can see 3D scars, technology trigger, da da da. And now within surveying work, say in the UK, we're talking about traditional laser scanning. Traditional laser scanning, great. Didn't have them really, you know, in companies to get our hands on quite easily until about five, six years ago. But now as we go into handheld, you know, either the Zeb one or the Pegasus type systems where people are starting to use them like that. We're going but reverting back now to traditional laser scanning. You see talking yesterday about putting them on uh, drones, etc., UAV usage. That's what I mean. Things are evolving. 3D printing up here, everybody was getting very excited by that. You know, we're at the we're at the top of the peak of inflated expectations. Imagine what we can do with 3D printing, etc. Before we suddenly discover that it's not going to do all these things we thought it was going to do. We get bored with it, fed up, and then eventually we start to look at how it's going to, uh, to actually happen. So everything is on this curve in some way. You know, uh, big data, it, all these issues in BIM, etc., are no issue for it. This is at 2014, you can see big data already come down. A friend of mine who's involved in big data in the City of London, the, uh, the strategic asset management issue, said the problem with big data is now that we have loads of answers, 
but we've kind of forgotten what the question was. So we have loads of information that tell us all kinds of things, but we re don't really know what we really want to do with it in the first place. So the Garner hype curve, I think, helps us put some of these issues into reality. And I think that BIM and smart cities can fall easily into this. Is that you, we can get a bit carried away sometimes with the technology and the hype behind it, without forgetting the reality and the true drivers behind, you know, making us do what we, we do. And it's essentially down to policy and economics, really, at the end of the day and also creating an environment for people to live within. The reality of BIM, from our experience within the RICS, surveys of our members, for instance, we're in the valuation space, it shows that only 25% of them, or less, are even using two-dimensional CAD systems at the moment. We think everybody has access to the same type of data and systems we do. No, they don't. Most people work in small to medium-sized enterprises in small towns all over Holland, for instance. They won't be as linked in as we think they are. This goes for all the professions, planners, engineers, architects, of ours. Practical hands-on experience, five plus years, yeah, virtually none, no experience whatsoever, 67%. This is 25,000 of our members in the construction area who say they have no experience of BIM at the moment. But the main driver behind the use of BIM is basically down to legis uh, legislation. There's only two countries in the world that have legislated the use of building information uh, technology within the construction scenario. It's the UK and Singapore. So all UK government procured projects over two million pounds. School refits, as a simple example, hospitals, for instance, at, on a small level, must be BIM compliant, or you're not getting the job. Don't even tender. So a lot of the big construction companies are taken on. And they're then expecting us, as, uh, as the subcontractors, to then carry it out. Quickly into the, uh, the mindset of architects and how they think about it. This is the digital plan of works that architects use to put together strategic construction plans. Doesn't matter the size of the project. And uh, I think the important thing to realize about this is where the money goes within it. This is what's known as the uh, capex end of things. And this is the opex the operational. BIM works across all the different areas because the systems have to work together. <coughs> we looked at uh, building information modeling and its usages at different stages of projects. And you can see that the, uh, the major use is during the design development. This is when people are feeding into BIM models, when they're scanning on site, for instance, taking three-dimensional model as built, feeding them back into the model themselves. So there's a real strong need there for a strong survey specification at the very start of these issues. Otherwise, they won't, they won't build. And I think that's the scenario with a BIM. And I'm going to get to a picture of a BIM model. We'll get past this for a minute. Yeah? There's our BIM model. Now, we're used to seeing the geospatial elements of this and the actual physicality of it. And somebody was talking to me the other day about how the design world and the real world are starting to merge together through the use of geospatial information. So what's being designed and what's actually there in reality are starting to come together quite slowly, where actually they used to be quite separate. Now, the issue about a BIM model, for instance, is that the, this geospatial element here, for instance, which could be this, this, this light up here, is only really 20% of the information that's within this model. The rest of it is all the long tail of metadata behind it. What's the voltage of the light? When was the bulb blast changed? How much did it cost? Who did it? What's the telephone number? When are we going to do it again? All of that type of it, what's its voltage? How much electricity did it use last month? All that information behind it is essentially the majority of what's contained within a BIM information system, building information modeling system, an asset management system. So, you know, really what we see from a geospatial point of view is kind of the tip of the iceberg. I'll get past this a bit and get onto the smart cities. When we talk about level two and level zero, and I can see even this year, the geospatial world is starting to wake up the BIM at last. Intergeo has a big BIM uh, element within it, stream, which is great. I know the Scandinavians, for instance, have been adopting BIM quite heavily, as have the French and the Germans. But when we speak about the different levels within it, essentially CAD is level zero, null intelligent information. Level one is when 2D and three-dimensional information is contained. Level two 
is when we just start to add files, start to add lots of metadata. It's actually quite simple, that stuff. Then when we go into level three, you know, we start to look at this integrated interoperable data system, everybody sharing this ty different types of information, architects sharing information with engineers, sharing information with planners, cost engineers, etc. So it's fully integrated web services where everybody has the same type of scenario and the same type of access. But the reality of it is very different. We in the UK put together a group called Survey for BIM, all these different organizations, AGI, Ordnance Survey, RICS, Network Rail, uh, the vendors, Trimble, Leica, Topcon, you know, the usual suspects, <coughs> to look at the reality of BIM and putting it into practice. Because without a lot of what we do, you know, the risk and rework and delay and cost, and I told the lads I'd stick this in if I got a chance, it's not going to work. So <coughs> within our areas, these issues of generalization are pretty critical, level of detail. But to my mind, the biggest issue we have to deal with is, is interoperability. And I think we heard this yesterday as well, about interoperability between data systems and communication systems, geotechnology systems, and software systems, and also those different scales and how they work together. This is the RICS. Those of you who've been there, this is a scan of our building. We just finished it a couple of weeks ago. We first did it two years ago, in the dawn of time of laser scanning. Two years is a long time in laser scanning techniques. Uh, the reason I like to put this one up, because this guy is having a cigarette there. Those of you who know laser scanning modeling will know he must have stood there still for quite a long time to come up in that kind of level of detail. And uh, we know him compared to the, the ghosts walking up and down the street. So. <coughs> this is our library, complex building. The RICS is two buildings shoved together, Victorian building and a Georgian building. Like I said, most of our built environment already exists. So the work essentially is not going to be in new design work. It's going to be in retrofitting. It's going to be in BIMizing a building like this. Imagine how complex that's going to be. Not a straight line in our building. So five days to do the scanning, three months to put it into a relevant level two rivet BIM model. There's a lot of cleaning, there's a lot of human interaction still needed. And then when we speak about other issues, I know you're all thinking that, oh, isn't there all this kind of software out there that automatically tags into stuff, etc. Yeah, up to a point, and then there isn't. There's still a lot of human interaction needed. Then when we start to look into in other issues within the BIM model scenario, such as, rentable area, a valuation, you know, the bit where you actually decide on the worth of a building and rental potential and usable area, those bits that actually drive what we do, you start to get different answers out of it. We start to disassemble the model, start to look at reconstruction costs, start to componentize different elements of the building. Don't forget, the scan is essentially, you know, non-intelligent information. So to attach that kind of information to different components takes a hell of a lot of work. As yet, scanners can't see through walls, unless you're going to tell me something new, Christoph. But you know, there's no x-ray capacity. We can't see what's in there. We can't see the type of steel or the electronics or what type of works there is. There's a lot of work going on on this, but you know, there's still a long way to go on it. When we're talking about rental area in an area of central London, like where our building are, we're talking about 300 euros a square meter in potential rent. So you know measurement becomes incredibly important. Having some kind of consistent scenario where we all know what we're talking about, like we've done say with the international property measurement standards, so people compare like what like. So if Google are looking at offices in London compared to Berlin or Paris, they can realize that the rentable area they're being quoted includes or doesn't include certain elements, like balconies and unincluded. This is all quite basic stuff, but you know this is where a lot of the money is taken up. And then the same goes into the land measurement standards that we're working on as well. So it's that consistency and understanding that's absolutely critical. <coughs> we're also starting to see now BIM starting to move into the legal world, starting to move into the 3D cadastral world. The Australians are particularly strong on this and have done a nice piece for us. But looking at the legal and the leasehold issues, <coughs> How are those things linked together? You know, you can imagine in a, a, a supermarket scenario, shopping centers, value is done depending on how close you are to the front of the shop, for instance. 
there's different grades, there's different levels of these things. We need to integrate this economic property geography within our geospatial information so people can start to understand the wart of what they're starting to use. So BIM. I won't go into our measured surveys and, and do you all in, but it's essentially a deliverable. But really, the issue behind it is the need for standards. Uh, I can give sticks out later, and I'll speak a bit about some of these in a moment. We in RICS have been doing a lot of work on different standards, BIM adoption in India, uh, building information modeling in the value dimension, BIM implementation guides, 5D BIM, that's time and then cost, etc. Though you could add that cost is not a dimension, but that's not my uh, scenario. And then also into BSI, which is the, the British equivalent of CEN, and related to ISO as well. You know, so it's very, very important that we all try to work together on some kind of understanding of information within this. But then on to our issues of how does BIM connect with the smart city scenario. Like it was really great to hear about the climate change end of things. I think that these, these issues of sustainable urban drainage, uh, localized energy, telecommunications. The, we had some breakout sessions yesterday, uh, I think one on urban planning, where we spoke about uh, information technology and sensors and big data and smart cities, etc. But you know, essentially, how do these things, two things marry up? Because what we're essentially looking at is two very different data sets. We're looking at a localized, building-specific data set that is privately financed either by a building owner or by a building company or by a developer. And then we're looking at a large-scale geographic data set that is publicly financed. So the issues of financing are critical in the understanding between the two systems. Ours are the issues of policy. How does a policymaker, first of all, implement a system like a smart city system <coughs> and understand the different uh, technology and delivery issues behind it, make it attractive enough for individuals or individual building owners to add their information into the mix? What are they going to get out of that, really, at the end of the day? Because that's their intellectual property as they see it. So there's a lot of other scenarios to work on. Not just the, uh, the technology communication issues which we're used to, such as through the Open Geospatial Consortium, different language issues again, just as a basic scenario, city GML language issues, indoor GML language issues. How do these two data systems marry together? There's also a, uh, a new group starts up called Building Smart, looking at open source BIM technology. At the moment, several vendors have almost a, uh, a very tight hold on the type of uh, information that we can possibly get our hands on, through being the only ones who have the type of BIM software available. But, you know, these other issues of infrastructure and energy, waste, and then also into the planning end of things, just slightly, looking into placemaking, you know, this information the geo-information, all that we have. How does it inform where citizens live? How does it inform value? How does it inform basic type of municipal issues such as transport integration and <coughs> waste collection? In the developing world, the UNECE have been looking at smart cities light, <coughs> certain indicators around these systems. How do they help people to just make those basic decisions, say, on refuse collection? And then, of course, there's the argument about what is a smart city in the first place. I would generally argue that a place like Amsterdam is a pretty smart city. I'm sure we have plenty of stupid cities around the world, but I think most of them are actually planned reasonably quite well. But, you know, a, a city like Amsterdam, where it has utilized its uh, environmental capacity to give citizens a, a decent standard of living and has been quite successful, maybe similar to Venice, is almost historically a smart city. This is just about back to the Gartner hype curve again, terminologies that we're using for doing things that we've been doing for quite a long time anyway, just putting them into a new type of language and a new type of scenario. These are two key outputs from the UK over the last year or so. This one is particularly important. I have a copy always in front of me. 
This is looking at how we get these issues of smart cities and our geotechnologies across to policy makers. The type of language they understand. So when you're speaking to the mayor of Amsterdam and you want them to integrate like the issues you mentioned you had with policy makers, we can blind them with science, we can blind them with data, we can start to use words they don't understand, they will switch off immediately. If there's not money on the front page, they don't want to listen, etc., etc. So it's about, you know, using the wow factor behind geo-information to get through that policy issues and also making it work their while. Putting it into language that's going to help them get re-elected for instance. So this is particularly important. Yeah. It's about the policy aspects of smart city integration, about how to get those technological solutions uh, into a language that policymakers will be prepared to take on. <coughs> and as I mentioned about legislation, this is Digital Built Britain, Level 3 Building Information Modeling Strategic Plan, but integrating all of this information together, done by our colleagues in UCL, and digital build Britain. So the two elements are absolutely critical to understand which direction that we're going in. Hmm. So the economic drivers behind smart cities, once again, are pretty staggering in the amount of money involved. The global market estimate, those of you who are interested in such things, are 400 billion by 2020. Smart, smart cities engagement, and the UK market alone, 40 billion. As somebody mentioned, I think, recently, no, probably another event I was at, the, the United Kingdom is one of the most densely populated parts of Europe. They're quite urbanized. I think 70% of the population lives in urban areas, for instance. So, you know, how do we use smart city technologies? And I think this is the same for most of the West, to keep these creaking Victorian infrastructures actually going reasonably well. 20% of our water in London is lost through leakage alone, for instance. Our tube and transport systems are over 100 years old. So how do we keep on renovating and keep on getting these things to work properly? And that's essentially what this information and the geo-information that we put into these systems are going to help people to do. On transport, on energy, on healthcare, on water, on waste, and on telecommunications. And if these two elements, namely energy, is not available to either through localized energy, energy production, through wind or solar, or uh, bio waste, for instance, and the telecommunications infrastructure is not in place, well then the smart city scenario won't really work. I'm back on to more money again on the economic drivers. And this was the bit that I wanted to come back to, not just the climate change targets around asset management and what we do, but the level two case studies showing that you know, there's a 20% capital saving against 2009-10 benchmarks. And that's what people like to see. That's what governments like to see. It's very hard to benchmark airports. If you try and benchmark the cost of building an airport in different countries, it's hard to get any kind of real empirical information to decide what the best type of model of airport is going to be. Because not, that's not the way that things work. It's easier to benchmark, say, the cost of how to build a house. But when we're talking about a very large infrastructure, critical social infrastructure and political uh, infrastructure, like the building of a new railway, for instance, it's very hard to get that benchmark information. We had an Indonesian delegation in a couple of days ago into our ICS. They wanted to talk about cadastra, they wanted to talk about uh, GIS, they wanted to talk about you know, uh, professional capacity. But what they really wanted to talk about was the issues they're going through in the building of a high-speed rail link between Jakarta and a city on the other end of the island, uh, Bandung, and the issues around compulsory purchase of land and appropriate levels of compensation, and dealing with people, and tenure security, and all those grayer, softer areas that, yeah, geo-information can help inform, but actually it's the reality of dealing with people on the ground that's the critical element. But you know, that's why they're interested in HS2, what's going on in the UK, how to benchmark between those different types of large infrastructural development, so that you can show where the costings can occur. Now, the 20% uh, cost savings in level 2 BIM, that means that every building that will use a BIM type of scenario, say if you demolish this hotel 
and rebuilt it using BIM technologies, you would save 20% on then doing it in a non-BIM non scenario. It doesn't work all the time. In Dublin, my hometown, our new rugby stadium, the Aviva Stadium, where we held off Wales very gallantly last week, was uh, only the roof was done using BIM because the construction contractors, probably including my own father, said we're not using this. As my dad has often said to me, do you really think I'm not going to use a stone mason that I've used for the last 20, 30 years just because he's not using the BIM model? Get real about how it's going to go. So, you know, there's a long issue of things that we're going to have to deal with. Complex uh, new construction, maybe, but the 20% capital savings essentially goes into the development mix. So, you know, land value, land value uplift and how that works is another issue that, say, international or uh, national government are very interested in. <coughs> this is a, a very small example. A hectare of agricultural grade A agricultural land in the UK is £30,000. If its zoning changes to residential, its value is £10 million. Pounds. If its zoning changes to commercial, its value is £100 million overnight. So where does that difference in value go? How do you capture that value? Many countries have done that around the world to fund entire transport infrastructure, such as the Chinese, actually. Their local authorities have funded most of their infrastructural development based on land value uplift. And geo-information and smart city technologies can help local authorities become more aware of where that money is going to go. So yeah, we can become more efficient. We can help people become more efficient in how they do things, certainly in a construction scenario. But that doesn't mean we're going to get paid 20% more for doing what we do. That cost savings will essentially go into development costs and into the land value uplift. So land will become even more expensive. When I, say, I dread to think how much a hectare of land in central Amsterdam is actually worth for development costs. Astonishing amount of money. And these are the issues we need to think of. We're not just there to provide information for people. We're a cog in a big machine. You know, uh, at the moment, I would suggest that most of our industry, we're providing geo-information in an objective scenario, an objective sense, as an application, almost. We're really, it's about what people are using it for. It's about the subjective element. The money is in making a decision about something, about de-risking somebody's investment process. And if our information can help to do that, well then that's where we're going to get somewhere. Oh. But you know, this is probably a vision of the future. Uh, not Blade Runner, exactly. You're the one with Tom Cruise in it that everybody goes on about. You know, with the cars going around and all that kind of stuff. Where, the, where, where buildings are tied into a, a general information system. But all of these things are not going to work, essentially, if we're all talking to each other on certain communication levels. And not just the technology language communication level, city GML, indoor GML, da da da, da everything talking, but also on a policy and an economic point of view. Because essentially what we're doing is we're, we're de-risking this urbanization process. And with the effects of rapid urbanization, particularly in the developing world, this becomes even more and more relevant and tying in the climate resilience issues as well at the same time. So, it's an enormously big picture and uh, I think that was quite good. You don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step, which I wish I had have, uh, taken as advice to you tonight when I slipped over. Anyway, so there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>